So we're going to uh, pick four of the best of those and uh, investigate them in more detail. Josh, we start with the Daily Mail. Yes, yeah, so never mind spy balloons at 60,000 feet. Worry about the Chinese cameras six feet over our heads. So we seem to be hearing a lot about this, about the different Chinese technology. But what's different about this report is that these are actual things that have already been banned from, uh, you know, from our defence forces and, and whatnot. But actually, yep. it turns out that they're being used still by our police forces. So uh -huh. um, Huawei, uh, different constabularies uh, are still using uh, Huawei. Huawei? Huawei. 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 It's cultural appropriation, <laughs> sorry. And um, Hick Vision, which is uh, various CCTV cameras, they're used also by different forces. And also the drone manufacturers, which have been banned elsewhere, are still being used uh, by the So this police. is CCTV, this is surveillance cameras on the high streets and yeah. in businesses and so on in car parks. And also the way they communicate with each other, yeah. different police. So, they're, they're, you know, that Chinese technology is embedded within these different forces, yeah. uh, even though other places they're being pulled out. So I suppose one of the questions is, is there any suggestion that these cameras have a secret feed that is relaying information back? Because we know that Huawei were doing that for some of their other installations. Well, there's no reason to think that that wasn't happening. No. So okay. there's no necessary proof, definitive proof. I suppose it's the difference between sort of buying a, uh, an implement from a, from a discredited firm and actually having like an IT installation in your firm, which is just funneling mm -hmm. all your information back to... Do you know what I mean? It's a slightly different... This is, it's never entirely clear what exactly is being transgressed. Francis? Do you have yes, absolutely. I think what this shows is how dependent, how reliant we have become on Chinese imports and Chinese technology yeah. without realising long term what that deal actually is. Because a lot of the time we're buying these cheap Chinese products, but there's a saying in Venezuela, which is everything that starts off cheap at the beginning ends up expensive at the end. Yes. Also, uh, el excremente del diablo. Exactamente. Yes. Muy bueno, yes. Simón. Yeah, well, I think that's exactly right. I remember when we were at, um, in a similar sort of situation with Russia mm. uh, in the 1980s, early 1980s. Obviously, the Cold War was still very much in play. Russia were in Afghanistan at that time. And I passed my O-levels, and my mum bought me a Zenith camera, <laughs> which was a Russian brand, but it was the cheapest SLR you could get. It had a, a lens that took three minutes to screw on. It had such a long screw thread and solid brass. I did think that's a little bit dubious. Yes. I was a little bit anxious, yeah. even though I was taking pictures on film. Going back. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was so ham-fisted with the light meter that I don't um, think they got anything worthwhile. There's one more little thing here, just yes. at the top there. It's a trans clinic scandal shows what happens when good people are branded bigots for speaking out. Mm. And this is the travesty that's been going on at the Travis Stock Centre. Mm. Yes. And how a book's come out this week. Uh, supposedly it's excellent. It's got five-star reviews. And Whose book? Uh, Not Sarah Vine. No, it's not Sarah Vai's book. Yeah. No, it's a producer who worked at the BBC who worked on ah, this yes. story. Yeah. So she's brought this book out and revealed what's happened now. It's obviously closing. Yeah. But it's essentially a massive medical scandal that was let happen and how these mm. children were failed by all the adults around them. And it was, they were failed really with a culture of fear. That's right, culture of fear and, and the chilling effect that uh, the people talk about cancel culture and they always identify the people who've actually lost their jobs, been kicked out of the academy, out of, uh, lost their professorships and so on. But it's, it's the second tier, isn't it, that's much more worrying, actually. It's the number of people who just never, who are just not inclined to actually blow the whistle or raise their head at all, you know, that is the worrying uh, aspect of it, I think. And I think this is the problem. It's that when you have people whose livelihood depends on their jobs yeah. and they have mortgages and they have families to support, yeah. why are they going to blow the whistle when the reality is is that it's then going to impact negatively on their careers. We actually yeah. interviewed one of the, on my show, Trigonometry, one of the whistleblowers from this Tavistock. Good plug. Yeah, yes. thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> and he brilliant. actually made the point that uh, a lot of the people at the Tavistock were more interested in ideology than they were in patient care. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big, um, like, uh, general trend in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an awful lot of things on which a, a, an acceptable opinion is formed very early on and a consensus gathers around it. Absolutely. And anyone who speaks against it is going, oh, you're a conspiracy mm. theorist or a, a phobia or some sort. Mm. The Times, France,